All right, we can go ahead and get in the demo. So this week, uh, like I said earlier, it is the Bad Honey Bun Games virtual reality team with Danny and Sean. So let's go ahead and get started. Come on, boy, Blue. Whoa, oh, sorry, sorry. I got too excited. Hello, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. My name is Danny. This is Sean. Let's see. You want to work on this? We didn't uh, just go with us. We did not rehearse this. Yeah, we had ran into some issues in the game itself, so we've been a little bit stressed out, but hey, we're happy to be here. Let's go ahead and start. Let's see how we want to go. Uh, our game is called Conversion Artificial Dawn. The name is just something we kind of threw together and just kind of, good? <laughs> kind of like how gaming is, you know, like the original game that we actually started is not the same game we have now. A lot of times you, when you work on a project, some things work, some things don't work. Eventually, you, you'll, you'll find something. You throw a bunch of things up there, you know. I talked to my friend Jay Chow a few times about what you want to do with life. To me, I have a little bit more simpler kind of thing where I know exactly what I want. Some people don't know what they want, they throw a bunch of things up there to see what works. Same thing with our name, our game. We started with the game that, you know, we can cast magic and ended up switching to that just because uh, Gaetan gave us a good suggestion of like, you only have four months, how about you change the scope of your project? Same thing with Rabbit Cloud. Once you join, you know, you have to think about your project. Can you set out to do something? Can you do it in four months? Can you get an MVP in four months? The original plan we had to do was a little bit bigger than we wanted to do. Um, it might have taken us quite a while to do it. He had to tell us twice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we, we didn't give up. Though. We, did, we did get something kind of working. After we get it kind of working, we started to see, like, okay, maybe someone who has more experience and their feedback is kind of important. So what's nice about 42 is we get a lot of feedback. And one of the things is, hey, you know, change the scope of your project. So something, what do you guys like? To me, I like growing up, playing the games in the arcade, golf land, if you're ever from Stockton. Um, Time Crisis is one of like, the dopest games I play. I go to the day of buses, I still play that game. It's nice, it's fun, it's quick, easy. I don't really see that game in VR, and it looks like something that we can kind of start off kind of doing. Mm -hmm. Press that. All right. Uh, can I press pause? Is it pause? No. Apparently not. How do you go back? This is new to me. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, this is kind of a montage of uh, how we got to where we are today, starting from the very beginning. Look at those graphics. Hey. <laughs> so we started with Unity. Why do we choose Unity over other engines? Um, as I said, you know, we only allow a certain amount of time. What can you pick up, get on the ground, and just kind of run? Uh, C Sharp is a little more simpler than C++, which is the giant monster itself. I felt like Unreal was kind of a bigger um, thing to kind of tackle. Uh, I have a little experience in Unity and a little experience with C Sharp. It was something I can kind of hit the ground and kind of roll in. So I did a few tutorials. This is one of the first shot at, you know, a first person shooter kind of thing. You're able to look around, you can shoot, that's a little gaze thing. You had a weapon, but uh, it's not in the recording thing right there. It's on, also a block. So from there, we went to something like this. So same concept, you can move around with that, you can teleport a little bit. And then someone suggested like, why zombies? Don't do any kind of zombies, zombies are scary. So we chose not to do zombies, but. Here, so we're starting to get a little more uh, better at uh, coding in general. So the idea was Unity has a third person tutorial, right? So can we take something that uh, hasn't been in VR. Can we take just a random idea and can we make it VR? These are assets given freely. Eventually, we'll do a tutorial about this. So we take the third person tutorial. They have all these elephants and actions and sounds. And we added in the Oculus VR SDK and threw it inside of VR. We started playing around with different sounds, different things. What if we played around with like time? What if we stopped time? Like, cause he was trying to do something like time crisis, right? And then we make you like, we force you to do a pose, like, you know, kind of like you walk away from something like a thing's blowing up, like we made you do a pose to kind of to regular time again. So cool, we got that. So we can take an idea, we can make it into something, we can shoot, people can die. So that's, 
still going along and saying, no, let's, um, let's make our own map. Let's grab our own assets. Let's try, start making kind of like a story gun. So this is our first shot of actually, uh, Sean built this level from just like three assets. Again, uh, anybody have money, please let us know. <laughs> but what the, the game is our ideas plus what available resources we have. And this is something we get from, what is it? Uh, Brackies. Brackies, he has, a, so somebody called Brackies, you don't need to know, but basically there's free assets out there, you just kind of have to look. And we found these and Sean was able to set up this level. And this is our first attempt at the kind of the time crisis like feel. Can you, on a rail system, you get to some point, say action, and then enemies come, can you do something, right? And uh, notice the sounds are from the original time crisis <laughs> at this point. Not anymore. Look at those enemies. Everybody just kind of sliding through. <laughs> it's a feature. You know, all the enemies get close, they start moonwalking to you. It's all right. So now we, we grew up a little bit. So enemies that can actually stop, they actually die now. We have our own music, different sounds. As you can see, enemies kind of show up behind you, and you don't really know they're there. So that might be an issue. We have a sniper in the back. All right, so that's getting better. So now, this is what the game looks like now. A little bit higher graphics. You can see the animation in the guns, different sounds. And you can have to see that the enemy indicator there. Originally, we had like a mini map. Then everybody told us, the mini map is useless. So, you know, <laughs> that's what... It's Looking nice having you, a lot of testers. Eventually, you start understanding. You see a trend. It might be easy for you, but even that's not the same thing for anybody else. If you see like your 50 testers, 40 of them say something's useless, it might be that you're wrong. So hey, we listen. We do something different. We learn. You know. What is this? Kind of development. Do we press play or? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. This is what kind of looks like now. The game's a little bit darker. We want it had it like that feel. You start off in as dusk, and eventually you get to the boss stage. It gets much darker. Um, VR has a few benchmarks. Oculus itself has a few benchmarks. Your console game probably runs like 45 FPS, 60 FPS. You're happy if it runs at 75 FPS. Our game has to run at 90 FPS. So how do you get something like that? So you got to cut a few corners. As you get closer to different models, they have much higher textures where when things are far away, they have a lot shittier textures. Yep. And anything that you can't visibly, that's not in front of your gaze, is not rendered at all. Uh, and that's really actually very easy to do uh, thanks to uh, setting that Unity has. We didn't have to do the math for it, thank God. So the medium we wouldn't want to work with is VR, right? So what's cool about VR? We, we, instead of you using a controller, you staring at a screen, what's different about VR? Why did we choose our company to be in VR? We think VR is the future of entertainment and gaming. Why? Because we can put you somewhere and make you feel like you're in the world. We give you controllers. We build the whole world around you, right? So in the beginning, we didn't really know how to interface with the world around you. We had a very simple thing. We know how to shoot stuff very well. We can shoot anything. <laughs> and from there, you know, we wanted to start slowly learning how to interact with the world around us. So the menu did start with uh, you had to shoot everything that you wanted to do. You wanted to go to the options, you had to shoot it. You wanted to start the game, you had to shoot it. Notice that person right there. What was the first thing, first thing he did? He started shooting at everything. We learned that any kind of tutorial you do, you put something in front of anybody and you give them a gun, they're going to shoot it. So eventually we learned to start building things separately. The tutorial is in a different level. The mission control is a different area. The tutorial itself is, starts you off. I walk you through everything, baby steps. Then I let you shoot stuff. Here you can start... You have to shoot through different things, right? So cool, we found this hover panel thing that you're able to take a proximity to where that finger is, right? You can touch it, you can kind of move around with it. So what can we do with this? You can change the volumes kind of thing. This is a very kind of primitive idea of my, my first take at it, you know? Eventually we start building the world around it, give it some more sound, more some feedback. People love sound, you know, you want to feel like it's there. 
you should have some kind of reaction when you do something inside VR. Otherwise, it kind of takes it away from that aspect. So for now, you have hover panels. You get that minority report field. So how do you push that farther? Let's make everything holographic. <laughs> You can touch everything, it gives you root access. Then <laughs> <laughs> that's your boss right there, the shadow boss. So a lot of times our game has changed exactly just from all the feedback we get. We get a lot of people who have experience in VR, no experience in VR, people who get scared at the little things, people think everything's kind of boring. So it's nice to get all walks of life kind of play test your game. If you're making a product, I highly suggest get as many people, as many different types of people that keep testing your product. Yeah, so uh, both of us are come from similar coding backgrounds, basically nothing before 42, um, <laughs> and experience as uh, game developers is, for me, it's just a global game jam at Facebook, um, and then working with Danny, that's it. Um, I built a little, few, like a few games. Uh, we started Moonlight in November. I started making games in August, a few months before that, because this is kind of what I wanted to do, so. Yeah. Uh, me too, I actually came to 42 to make games. How about uh, that? Generally. How about that? Generally. Sean, what do you want to do with life? <laughs> make games. Make games. Play games, make games, and then play games. <laughs> Anybody else? What do you guys want to do? Why did you guys come to 42? <laughs> The guy wants to play games. You don't want to make games, you want to play the games. Okay, you get rich <laughs> enough so you can play games every day. That's understandable. For me, uh, the reason why I quit my job, moved all the way out here, because I thought VR was going to be the future. Uh, there's a thing called Sword Art Online. I was like, I, don't, <laughs> I haven't seen anybody attempt it or done it very well, so you know what? If you want something, do it yourself. So eventually, I'll get you there. Uh, if I trap you on my side of my game, I'm sorry, but hey, it'll be <laughs> worth it, though. And uh, a lot of things has happened. I almost quit, like, at 42 in general and just gone back home and everything else. And a lot of people kind of told me, you know, you got to keep chasing, you got to keep chasing. All this time you put into something. Like, remember why you're here. Remember why you do something. For me, VR was exactly why I came to 42. And Rabbit Cloud is actually, thanks to Josh here, has actually helped me a lot in pushing me to do exactly that. Now that's exactly what we do. We make VR games. Any questions, questions, answers? Over there. Uh. That is blasphemy. <laughs> VR can only be used for gaming. <laughs> Repeat the question. The so question. he asked, like, is there anything besides gaming for that, actually? Uh, me and Andy actually went to a talk done by people from Pixar and HTC, hosted by them. And we met the, the manager for the Vive Foot, which is the, uh, the Oculus competitor, which is the Vive. And that manager, she does like the all acquisitions of different things. And we, she, we took her to the side and asked her, like, what does HTC want? She says, I want anything not gaming. <laughs> And that crushed me so much. <laughs> this is the lady who could like fund my game, get her, give me a spotlight, and she told us, I don't want any games. Like, damn. <laughs> Why? Because gaming is an engine that kind of runs itself. That was the first thing you thought of. The, uh, like, so Doom, like, like say like games from back in the day, like Doom and everything, like John Carmack created Doom, all of them have been trying to get into VR. Arcus is now CTO, is actually John Carmack, the creator of Doom. They're, all the gamers have been pushing for that. Eventually we all wanna be living in our game, get stuck in our game. So that engine kinda runs itself, so you don't have to worry about that. What the people they wanna get into VR are the non-gamers, the teachers, um, doctors, 
uh, anybody like mechanics, people who do CAD. So there are different applications out there. I've met a doctor, he was working with different companies trying to make surgery easier and training easier using VR. I met teachers who wanted uh, like a classroom set kind of in VR. What if you can teach about the kids about Egyptian, right, the Egyptians, and then you just transport them through Egypt. That course, the whole time you're there, I walk you through the pyramid, build the pyramid around you. That way the kids are more immersed and learning at the same time. Uh, cooking, um, do a little cooking thing. I show you what the ingredients look like, what's the proper way to kind of do it. So the applications for VR are a lot, but it just do you want to do it? Who's willing to work on it? Is there money behind it? I think there is. If you're interested in stuff like that, you know, we could talk later, but there are some pretty cool stuff out there. Yes, sir. So the question is locomotion inside virtual reality. So the first month of Rabbicon, they, they kind of expect you to do research about your product, research about the field, you know. So our first two weeks was just research. And one of the biggest talks at the Oculus Connect 4, which is the big Oculus conference, and they had one of the biggest like, rooms and the biggest crowds, it was locomotion research, what they've done and what they didn't work and what has worked. So there is a lot of different ways to move. You can teleport, as you said. You can move with a joystick. Um, our system is on a rail system. Rail system and it take you from A, point A to point B, like checkpoint to checkpoint. Uh, you can fly. Anything you we can do, you can pretty much do in VR. So we tried all of that. Um, Try moving with a thumbstick. Uh, the first one that you saw with Unity, uh, you saw that teleporting. And the second one that with a the little uh, bunnies and stuff like that, that if we stop time, you actually move with a thumbstick on that one. We tried flying. Um, you can put your something in front of you. You press the button and you go in that direction. Put something behind you, you go in the opposite direction. Kind of like Iron Man, kind of like Superman. Cool, try 10 seconds, like, great. Let's build a world around it. What if we try flying like Superman? I flew through a city, going left and right. Really, really cool. I threw up for six hours. <laughs> massive, massive motion sickness. I could not stomach anything. I didn't eat the rest of the day. I, I thought about food, I threw up again. So <laughs> the problem is, you know, as you're moving and then you move with the controller, you get that disassociation. How do you try to fix that? One way is for us, we tried to do the rail system because, you know, Time Crisis has that rail system. We start you off, we have a really slow acceleration. Then as you go, you start going a little bit faster. And then we put things in front of you so you have a point of direction, kind of like a HUD display, like a little circle right in front of you so you know what kind of direction you're kind of going. So there are different ways to combat motion sickness, but you can, there's a lot of different ways to move. What the biggest way, uh, the bigger companies are doing now, it's called tunneling. So when you're mo moving left or looking right, you can still move with a thumbstick, which still gets me kind of sick, but you can do that way. But to help with you that, they give you the free range you can see everything, but when you do decide to move, we tunnel the vision. So we tunnel the vision, so I give you more like a cockpit view. So if you go forward, you look left, that your field of view is reduced. The lower your field of view, uh, the less likely you are to get sick. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. And uh, another thing is to find a help with that motion sickness is we need to get your game running at 90 FPS. Oculus benchmarks your game. Anytime it drops below at 90 FPS, your game is done. So you have to optimize, optimize. Oh, yeah. So another thing about 42 is they teach you that where you have much uh, better coding practices. We know not to allocate, because uh, in C Sharp, you know, you do new variable, you allocate every single time. And games run in one function called the update, right? Update runs one time per frame. Your game runs at 90 frames per second. Update runs 90 times a second. You're allocating new information inside update. You're keep using more and more resources. That's one of the things we did pretty well where we don't allocate a lot of things. We're really pretty good with memory management. Yeah, that, uh, that can affect your game performance because uh, you, it'll do, uh, Unity will do an automatic garbage collection every, every time it really needs to. So if we are constantly making, uh, allocating for stuff and not freeing it or um, then we'll, we'll take a performance hit whenever the garbage collection happens.
So we want to reduce that as much as possible. So this talk, we wanted to kind of keep things a little more general. Uh, the next talk we do is you guys will have us back who we'll actually do more in-depth with code. What you guys learn upstairs, you know, if statements, while statements, you take that and that can apply directly to how you code. Your C code will work in C Sharp. Your C code will work with Unity. It's all about logic. If you press a button, I want to put something here. If you press a button, I want to fire something. If something gets hit, the thing has to die. If something gets hit, you lose 10 int. So the, the logic is still the same thing. You just have to learn more about whatever engine you're kind of creating with. Uh, that's one of the questions I do get. Like, how does you, what you learn upstairs affect like game development? How do you take what you learn from like things like FDF, a little simple wireframe, to something like a VR game? The code is very, very simple. Um, very, very similar. It is how you use your engine. Okay, so um, I have a question for both of you. So like, uh, how did the 42 curriculum prepare you for your own like game development? So what was the most helpful thing you learned from the 42 cur curriculum? How to do things uh, ourselves, basically. How to how to solve problems as quickly as possible. Um, if you're faced with a, oh, I don't know how to code this. Uh, well, I guess I'm stuck. I better just you know go go uh, go home. Uh, yeah, just figure things out yourself. Uh, use whatever resources you can, um, and anything is possible. How many of you have done a project and then you knew exactly what to do? Besides <laughs> you, Jai <Jecha. laughs> Get out of here. Most of the time, 100% of the time, every single time I approach a project, you know, like going from one project to the next project to the next project, I had no idea how to do that. But learning the 42 style, like I know the answers out there, I will find it. Things that we do get stuck on, things we don't know how to do, we know how to look for the right thing, and we're more aware of how to find what exactly we're looking for, how to ask the right questions. Learning themselves, as I said, like uh, the logics you learn upstairs, like if statements, while statements, you, that exactly works exactly the same. So if something happens, do something. If something happens, do something. Where do you store your data and how you pull your data? Uh, things returning different values. Um, go through my array, find the correct enemy that I want, return that enemy, put them in a different location. That's things that we learn upstairs. And good memory management, as I said, you know, not allocating a bunch of resources and using too much of the computer's resources. For ours, like, we have to be very careful with that. Our game needs to run very, very optimized, very fast, so you gotta be aware of that. Kind of answer your question? As I said, uh, next time we'll actually go a little more in depth with code. So we'll, I'll pull some code from what you have upstairs, you know, show some code here, and then we'll just run the VR game. We'll build the VR game for you guys next time. Give me 30 minutes, I'll build a VR game. <laughs> Can I inline assembly with C sharp? I have no idea. <laughs> you, you Google it. I'm sure you can find the right answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, actually I have two questions. The first question related a little bit to her question. How far were you in the virtual curriculum before jumping in bridging your project? And the next thing, the next question is, uh, how long does it take you to build this game? How far did you get, Sean? Uh, I was like just above level seven. What did you, what projects did you do? I did the graphics branch mostly, uh, and then uh, printf. So what is the graphics branch? Uh, FDF, uh, Fractal, and... Uh, Wolf 3D? Wolf 3D, yeah. Right. So FDF, as <laughs> you know, it's like a wireframe. You do a raster, you take a map, input a map, you take a rasterization of that. So take numbers, put it on the screen, and learn how to place more than one pixel on that. Uh, Fractal, you start using like the uh, an algorithm. Can you infinitely zoom? Can you use math to kind of put things on, move around the thing, mm -hmm. and move your map. Okay. Then Wolf 3D, you wanna explain more about Wolf 3D? Uh, it's a recreation of the Wolfenstein game. You use uh, the 
the whatever the column tracing algorithm is that I forget the name of, uh, to basically just draw lines. Ray tracing. Not ray tracing. Uh, the other one. Ray casting. Ray casting. Yeah, genius. So I'll give uh, you a little uh, background information about games. I love games, by the way. So Wolfenstein was like the f like the first game that allowed you to uh, move around the room. It was created by uh, John Carmack and uh, John Romero, um, ID Software. And they're the, actually the, they're the people who kind of created that genre of first person shooter. So when you're learning about different things, you're trying to push a product, learn the history of that. Things like Ready Player One, they kind of touch base on the history of video games. I love stuff like that. And um, it's, it's one of the earliest games where you're able to kind of move around from map to map kind of thing before that. Uh, before like John Carmack kind of thing, uh, PC did couldn't do what Nintendo did. That side scrolling, what Super Mario did, uh, nobody had any idea how to put that for the PC or for the Mac kind of thing. And John Carmack was able to kind of go through and kind of figure it out. He's kind of like us, where he kind of taught himself coding, and he just kind of learned by just by trying, trying a lot of different things that didn't work. Then your other question was, how far did we kind of get? I got to uh, level seven or level eight or something. I also went down the graphics branch. Um, I did only do FPF. I did look into Wolfenstein and uh, Doom, like the original like FPSs and stuff like that. Then I started doing like the special projects. I did a uh, database in C. I did the Ruby project. I did the C++ scene. That was actually the first game I made. They had a, so you ever get a chance to do the C++ scene, it gives you a good idea of what object-oriented programming is. 42 style, 42 style means they throw a bunch of stuff at you and they expect you to fail. And during the <laughs> rush though, you actually get to uh, recreate like a Space Invader kind of game. The idea is to take a little box, move something down, your player or some your spaceship is like a little dot and you're able to shoot another dot. All right, that's kind of boring. So we took it up a notch, we gave it color, we gave it a menu, we gave it a Star Wars theme song, Star Wars sound, it makes you explode and stuff like that. You, we're not gonna make it just a box, you know? You have the opportunity, that creativity to do something more. Same thing when you're making any other game. And we kind of took the attitude and pushed it out as far as you can go in anything we do. So given an idea, can you put your own twist to some project? Can you make it more, or you push for excellence? And on that note, I think we're done. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. I just want to say one last thing. Thank you for all you guys' input. Anybody who's ever tested the game, we almost, almost, maybe at the end of the day, maybe tomorrow, pushed our demo out to the Oculus Store, pushed it out to Ubisoft. Anybody with money? Anybody here with money? Uh, so that way, you know, some way we can try to get our game funded. If not, you know, get one of us a job. But thank you for all your input. Thank you for our testing. If one of us makes it, we all make it, baby. Hey.